everyone, it's Jack from Cultaholic.com and the Paul Heyman era rolls on towards Extreme Rules. This week was the go-home show for Extreme Rules. And yes, admittedly, we don't actually know how much of an impact Paul Heyman's having, but if you looked at last week's show, there were little bits and pieces that did seem a little bit Heyman-esque. And it was an improved show. Raw was good last week. Could that continue this week? There's only one way to find out, and that is by assigning each individual segment a lovely individual grade. That's right, it's time for Monday Night Raw Graded. The opening segment is Becky Lynch and Seth Rollins versus Andrade and Zelina Vega. That's right, for the second week in a row, we start off a wrestling show with a bloody wrestling match. Oh my God, let's all calm down. The reason we all need to calm down is because the rules of this one were weird and it's to fit in with this whole weird commercial break rule. There's no wrestling allowed in the commercial breaks, but it does need to be structured around wrestling segments and all the rest of it. So this was a mixed tag team match, you know, Rollins and Becky, Zelina and Andrade, but it was a, it was a mixed elimination tag team match. So as we'll see, there are some issues with that rule. As for the quality of the match itself, uh, you know what, it was a really fun match, and that's no surprise given the quality of the people involved, Seth, Andrade, Becky, even Zelina Vega, who isn't maybe on the same level as those three, is still an entertaining and effective character. She's got a certain charisma in the ring, even if her, you know, her moveset isn't quite as exciting or whatever. So the action was still pretty good, but this rule kind of just muddied the waters a little bit for me. So after a few minutes, Becky Lynch was able to eliminate Zelina Vega with a disarm her, tapping her out clean in the middle of the ring, and then Lacey Evans was in the crowd, and that destroyed distracted Becky and she got out of the ring and tried to get in Lacey Evans' face and she started to brawl with Lacey in the crowd and Rollins came over and stopped her and went, stop, break it up, stop it, stop it. And, and then we went to a commercial break, obviously. Then when we returned, Zelina had been eliminated and Becky was still on the apron, but she couldn't tag in because in the mixed tag rules of WWE, men can only fight men and women can only fight women. So what's the point? I don't really understand. But Seth and Andrade had a good match together, even if Becky was completely irrelevant on the outside, I guess. It did all break down on the outside, with uh, Zelina trying to get involved again, and Becky evening the odds, jumping off the apron onto Zelina Vega, and then it all kind of got chaotic. Andrade ran in to attack Rollins. Becky either pushed Rollins out of the way, or Rollins just moved and didn't realize what was going to happen, but Andrade clattered into Becky, and then Seth was like, you okay? You all right? And I just thought, mm, let's keep Becky a little bit strong. Come on, she should be fine. And she was, in fairness. It wasn't... It wasn't like she was a damsel in distress or anything. Seth eventually was able to hit the stomp for the win, or the blackout, you know, the, the, the stomp, the curb stomp. He hit the stomp on Andrade for the win, and the baby faces picked up the victory in a, in a match with just weird rules. Then, as they were celebrating on top of the ramp, they were jumped by Corbin and Lacey Evans, who beat them down. Lacey, <laughs> Lacey Evans smacked Becky full in the face. Shades of Nia Jax when she concussed Becky, but Becky seemed to be fine. But the slow motion replay showed that she did actually punch her in the face. And uh, the heels stood tall. They cut a little promo afterwards as well, saying, oh, where they're the new power couple in WWE, and maybe this feud's even going to break up Seth and Becky's relationship. I will be massively shocked if Seth and Becky do not pick up the win on Sunday, but we'll see how it goes. This gets a B grade. I really wanted to give it a B plus. It was a really enjoyable opening match, fast paced, lots of spots going on all over the place, cool stuff featuring all four members of the match, but it just got bogged down for me by that weird rule. The rules have to make sense to a degree in wrestling. And honestly, the whole elimination mix tag thing, it just intrinsically didn't work for me. But you know what? The quality of the match was still good. So I have given it a B grade. Next up, we had Paul Heyman, who strode out as Becky and Seth were recovering on top of the ramp, and he sort of looked at them and smirked as he went down to the ring, which I liked. It was a nice little touch. I enjoy when segments bleed into each other. It makes the whole thing feel a little bit more organic and a little bit more real, in my opinion. Heyman then cut a very interesting promo in the ring. He always finds, I guess, a bit of a unique angle, even if he's hyping up the same thing for like four or five weeks in a row. He always approaches it every week from a little bit of a different angle. He, again teased the fact that Lesnar was going to cash in on Seth or Kofi Kingston for their titles, uh, but he, he framed it in a really cool and unique way. So Heyman said, uh, basically, spoiler alert, Brock's going to cash in at Extreme Rules. But the last time I gave a spoiler alert was before WrestleMania 30, when Brock obviously beat The Undertaker, and Heyman told us all that was going to happen. And Heyman says, I've never given a spoiler alert since then. I don't know if that's true or not, but he said it, and it, and it worked in the context of the promo. He said, I've never given a spoiler since then, but you, you have to think, does that mean that this is definitely going to happen on Sunday? Or am I just messing with you? And I was like, ooh, it's good. I really enjoyed that from Heyman, getting a little bit cerebral a cerebral assassin, assassinating the minds of Seth and Kofi in a cerebral fashion. It's all about the game and how you play it, Paul, really. 
This promo for me gets a B plus. It wasn't anything totally groundbreaking, but I really enjoyed the little twist that he put on it. And, it. and it was delivered, of course, with the charisma and the passion that you'd expect from Paul Heyman, one of the best talkers in the game. Next up, sing along with me, everyone, because it's our favorite match type in this new era of Monday Night Raw. Two out of three fours, pitting The Miz and The Usos against Elias and The Revival. Early on in the match, Miz, who's now this kind of vengeful, angry babyface who just kicks ass and takes names, even though he couldn't beat Shane McMahon because he's the best in the world. Uh, early on in the match, Miz battered Elias on the outside, and Elias had just immediately had enough. He ran through the ring, out the other side, and just walked up the ramp and said, you know what, have it, you can have that match, that's fine, I don't want anything to do with The Miz. Back in the ring, this was kind of used as a little bit of a distraction, allowing the Revival to hit the Shadow Machine on one of the Usos and pick up the first four. But obviously, when we came back from commercial, it was three on two. It was the Revival versus the Usos and The Miz, because Elias had left the match. He'd abandoned his partners, and that led to the babyfaces picking up two quick pinfalls in succession. The first with the skull-crushing finale, the second with a big Uso splash from the top, and they won 2-1. Um, it was a good match. This, this was very similar to the opening match for me. Good concept, good action. Sorry, bad concept, good action. So the two out of three falls thing didn't again really work for me. Made Elias look like a total coward. I get that heels can often be made to look like cowards and it's fine, but it was a little bit too much for me. Couldn't even take part in a match with The Miz because he was too scared of him. Uh, I wanted to give this a B grade, but like the opening one, I'm going to knock it down a little bit. I'm going to give it a B minus because as good as the action was, it was bogged down by that strange commercial break stuff. Next up, we get the return of Rey Mysterio, who hasn't been seen since he took time off to deal with an injury. I think that was about five or six weeks ago, but he's back. Uh, obviously, last time we saw Rey, he relinquished the United States title back to Samoa Joe in very strange fashion, in my opinion. But he cut a promo addressing this. He said, you know, that was heartbreaking, but I've beaten the doctor's prediction. I'm back quicker than anybody imagined, and I'm ready to do battle on Monday Night Raw. I'm going to throw out an open challenge and see who wants to wrestle me. And that challenge was answered by Bobby Lashley. And Lashley just decimated Ray. He beat him in under a minute. Yes, Ray got some offense in. I think he even managed to hit the 619, but it all didn't really matter because within seconds, Lashley hit him with the spear, got the pinfall, and then continued the beatdown. Ray got absolutely squashed here. Ray Mysterio, former world heavyweight and WWE champion Ray Mysterio, the greatest masked wrestler in WWE history, as they are so often quick to remind us, just got absolutely dealt with in a minute, less than. Lashley then dragged Ray up the ramp and looked to throw him clean through the set, echoing the whole Strowman and Lashley spot from last week. But the referees came out and stopped him, so he just gorilla pressed Ray onto the pile of referees. Um, this was really strange because it was a really, really strong segment for Lashley. Really good week for him, really bad week for Rey Mysterio, who just was made to look like a little bit of a jobber. Not a jobber, it's Rey Bloody Mysterio, but he got beaten in quick and easy fashion. I'm going to give it a C minus, you know, it, it was fine, it, it just, it was surprising. I, I understand that you want to capitalise on Lashley's momentum heading into that last man standing match at Extreme Rules with Braun Strowman and that's totally fine by me, but maybe you could have picked someone else for him to demolish in seconds rather than Rey Mysterio. Not just the fact that it's Rey Mysterio and his legacy and, his, and how good he still even is in the ring, but more the fact that like... There are other candidates on the Raw roster. You have so many wrestlers that Lashley could have demolished. And also, you'd hyped up Ray's return, WWE. You'd got Ray's coming back. Hooray! Bang, he's done in a minute. It was really odd. Next up, Cesaro versus No Way Jose. Uh, before the bell had rung, Cesaro scared off the conga line on the outside, but Jose wasn't happy with that. It turns out that if you really want to anger No Way Jose and provoke him into a fight, you just need to mildly scare his conga line and he's ready to go. He got out of the ring, attacked Cesaro, they got back in the ring and the bell rang and No Way Jose had the advantage. But again, in about a minute, No Way Jose lost. Uh, Cesaro, I don't want to call it a squash match because it was back and forth. It was just a very, very short match. Big swing, sharpshooter, and No Way Jose tapped out clean. I'm going to give this a C- minus as well. Uh, not that it was bad or anything, and I do agree with Cesaro getting the victory, but it was the second really short match in a row. And at this point, Raw's momentum really ground to a halt. This was a tough, tough middle hour of Raw to get through, I'll be honest. Next up, the Viking Raiders versus two enhancement or local talents or jobbers, whatever you want to call them. Uh, the third squash match in a row. Yes, this lasted about a minute. The Viking Raiders hit all their moves and got the clean victory. And again, I, I just felt like Raw was grounding to a halt. It wasn't just the fault of the three short matches in a row, but there were loads of backstage segments as well, bogging stuff down. I'll talk about those in a little bit. And yeah, I, I just felt like at this point, Raw's momentum was completely sapped away and hopefully things would pick up towards the final hour. We'll find out if they did. 
This wasn't the end of the segment, however, because the 24-7 division, if we can call it a division, interrupted the end of the match. They all ran out. Drake Maverick was running away. Uh, R-Truth ended up in the ring facing down the Viking Raiders, and he just thought, I don't want any of that. Got out the ring and ran away in the opposite direction of Drake Maverick, though. So it remains to be seen whether he'll find him. I will recap all the 24-7 shenanigans from this week a little bit later on, because I like to lump them all together to make it an easier viewing experience for you. It's just for you, that. That segment, though, got a C-. minus. I just wasn't really enjoying Raw by this point. It, it really was a slog to get through, as I mentioned. But yes, let's see if things picked up. Let's see what happened next. Next up, Ricochet came out with his United States Championship and cut a babyface promo in the ring. He said he knows the club don't play fair. They rely on the numbers game, so he reckons he'll just have to take all of them out. Fair enough, Ricochet. Good babyface stuff there. But he was answered by AJ Styles and the club. And guess what? They all came out together, playing the numbers game, not fighting fair. He was totally right. Let's see what happened. AJ got the mic and cut a heel promo, a pretty short one, and just said, Ricochet, I've got some advice for you, mate. Enjoy it. Take your time. Slow down. Because before long, Luke Gallows is going to stomp a mud hole in you. Uh, that just set up Luke Gallows versus Ricochet. Stomp a mud hole. I thought maybe the glass would shatter and we'd get Stone Cold Steve Austin. Maybe he'd pop stunners off left, right. No, I didn't think that. Austin didn't come out. It was Luke Gallows versus Ricochet. The match didn't last very long. Uh, Gallows actually dominated the majority of it, I think. But Ricochet was able to slide down the back when Gallows lifted him up for a slam, got the sunset flip, and managed to, uh, to pick up the clean pinfall. And, and AJ and Anderson's reaction on the apron or on the outside was really funny. They were like, one, two, no. Oh, God damn it. Great heel stuff on the outside. I love when wrestlers react to stuff. It's always nice to see. So Styles got back on the mic and said, right, let's have you versus Carl Anderson then. And Ricochet, because he's a big, badass, fighting babyface boy, said, all right, let's have you then, come on. And then Ricochet and Anderson had a pretty good match too. In fact, this was probably the better of the two. I think they matched up a little bit better than Gallows and Ricochet did. Not that Gallows and Ricochet was bad, I just think I preferred this second half of the segment. Ricochet picked up the victory with the 6.30, and then the club were just on him, beating him down. Magic killer. Uh, AJ set up for the second rope Styles clash, but he let Ricochet fall down to the canvas and said, right, look, I'm a fair man. He's not. That's the, that's the very joke. He went, I'm a fair man. I'm going to leave some of you, Ricochet, for Sunday against me at Extreme Rules, as long as you stay down on the canvas. And then, you know, AJ and the club left, and Ricochet defiantly got to his feet. So AJ came back down and blasted him with the phenomenal forearm. I love that. That's a really smart and clever way of making AJ look ruthless and, and a bad man, and Ricochet look you know, brave and a bad man. Two different types of bad man. Watch the inflection in my voice, you'll understand. I'm gonna give this a B. The wrestling was all pretty cool and decent, but the real strength of this segment was the character work. I really did enjoy that Ricochet looked all defiant and ready to, you know, not stay down for anybody, and AJ Styles looked menacing and just a total heel once again. I wasn't certain when he turned back heel whether I preferred AJ as a heel or a babyface. I like him as both, but no, this week kind of made me realize I think I do prefer him as a heel sometimes, especially especially after so long as a babyface. It's really refreshing to see. Now let's do a roundup of all the 24-7 shenanigans and all that kind of stuff. Uh, this week was comparatively uneventful, I think, to last week with all the honeymoon and the wedding stuff recently. It kind of slowed down a little bit. That's not to say it wasn't entertaining, it just didn't have the fireworks of the past sort of week or so. This week's theme was sexiness, because Drake and his wife were about to get in on, because they still haven't consummated the marriage. Um, but then his wife was like, right, she's getting a bit sick of it, understandably. I mean, if my husband was running around defending his title against everyone for 24 hours a day, I'd be pretty annoyed too. Uh, Dre Maverick's like, I'm really sorry. You know what? Yes, let's totally bang, yo. That's what, how he talks to his wife. No. Uh, and then he, he heard a shout from afar because he was so excited to get it on with his wife, as he said in his own words. Uh, he shouted that. And then backstage, that was, you know, must have echoed around because he was immediately chased off by all of the 24-7 lads who often chase him. He said, I'm sorry. Stay right there. Left his wife sitting on like a production crate backstage and they all ran away. Later on, they appeared at ringside because that was during the whole Viking Raiders thing that I've already talked about. But Maverick was able to escape without suffering a pinfall. And then later on, he found his wife again. He went, oh my God, I've survived the night. I haven't lost my title. Let's get out of here. Uh, and then his wife was thrown from the production crate because our truth somehow had managed to get inside of it without her realizing. He stared down Drake Maverick. Carmella popped out of the crate next to them. She's also managed to get there without anyone finding out and went, get him. And they all ran off. Uh, R-Truth got a referee on his back as well because he thinks ahead. Good planning. A really nice touch here was uh, that as the whole 
crowd left and chased, you know, chased Drake and his wife away. Carmella waved to Bailey, who was on her way down to ringside for her match. She waved to her as they passed. Really love little touches like that, because Carmella and Bailey are best friends. That's the thing that's carried on from like NXT, and they've always kept that going. Love continuity like that. I'm such a sad man. This whole thing gets a B minus. As I say, it didn't have quite the fireworks of the past week or two, but at the same time, I did enjoy it for what it was, and it was better than a lot of the backstage stuff that went down on Raw. You know, I talked about how the middle hour of Raw was really bogged down by a lot of stuff. A lot of the stuff that dragged it down was kind of pointless backstage segments that were slotted in between those three squash matches. For example, we had Maria Kanellis being a dick to Mike still uh, in segments that weren't particularly funny or entertaining. And also, we had uh, a lot of Shane and Drew looking for a tag pot. No, I'll save that for the last bit of this video, but it was frustrating. Another frustrating thing as well was the Street Profits, who cut a couple of promos hyping Extreme Rules, but didn't really do or say anything. They still haven't had a segment at ringside or in the ring or even a match, so don't know what's quite going on with them. But this whole 24-7 thing, it gets a B-, and it was one of the better sort of backstage threads throughout this week's Raw. Next up, Bailey and Nikki Cross in a Beat the Clock challenge. The winner, whoever beats the their opponent in the quickest time gets to pick the stipulation for Alexa versus Bailey at Extreme Rules. Before this, earlier on in the night, we got a split screen interview with Bailey and Nikki. I was going to recap it, but nothing really new was said. It was more just kind of a retelling of the whole storyline with Bailey saying, Oh, Nikki, you're being manipulated. And Nikki saying, Bailey, you don't know what friendship is, blah, blah, blah. You, un you understand where this is all going. Bailey's opponent was Sarah Logan. Great to see Sarah Logan. She hasn't been around for a while, or at least I thought it was great to see her. Apparently, the crowd in New Jersey didn't agree with me because they had no interest in this match and it was a decent match too. Bailey and Sarah Logan, two very good wrestlers and the crowd decided to chant for CM Bloody Punk. Bailey picked up the victory in 4 minutes and 32 seconds with a sunset bomb into the turnbuckles. Interesting that that's now one of her stronger moves. It probably should be because it looks absolutely brutal. Please stop doing it to Alexa and people who've had a history of concussions and neck injuries, please. I'm not saying that's Bailey's decision, I, I just, you know. Um, yeah, 4.32 was the time for Nikki Cross to beat and her opponent was Dana Brooke. Again, for this match, the crowd were just absolutely dead. They just didn't want anything to do with it. And it was fine for what it was. Nikki Cross picked up the victory in about half the time that Bailey did. And for her stipulation choice, she picked a handicap match. So it's now going to be Alexa and Nikki versus Bailey for her title at Extreme Rules. I think that that could. Well, that, that leaves a lot of potential storyline avenues open, doesn't it? I'm going to give this a C. I think it was probably better than a C, but again, we have to take the crowd reaction into account. Crowds can often make or break a segment, and in this case, they really drag the quality of it down. Not the fault of any of the women in the ring. I'd, I'd suggest it's probably because Sarah Logan and Dana Brooke just haven't been seen for weeks and weeks and weeks. Well, Dana has, but she's been just getting everybody to flex during the commercial breaks. But Sarah Logan hasn't been on Raw for a long time, and that really did dampen the enthusiasm of a lot of the crowd. But not it's not their fault. It's just the way they've been booked. Um... So yeah, this segment gets a C, but I'm, I'm optimistic for the match at Extreme Rules, and I'll tell you why. It's because I think various things can happen. Alexa could win with the help of Nikki, Bailey could win with the help of maybe a returning Sasha Banks, that's been rumoured, and Nikki did say, actually, that Bailey needs to go and find a friend to slap some sense into her. Another thing that could happen, though, is that Nikki could win the title, and maybe Alexa would be really sad about that, and it turns out that Nikki's been the one manipulating the situation all along. Just to finish off the segment, I know I've already given it the C grade and everything, but it wasn't quite done yet. Uh, Nikki got right in Bailey's face and said that line about go and find a friend to slap some sense into you, and then Bailey just slapped some sense into Nikki, literally, and then beat her down with the belly to Bailey, or the belly to belly, never quite remember which one it is, and the elbow drop from the top rope. Seemed a little bit excessive from Bailey, actually, the old the do good baby face and everything, just battering her opponent. But as commentary said, she was sending a message to Alexa Bliss. And finally, let's talk about that main event. Oh, I'm sure you've heard about it by now, and if you haven't, I don't know what to make of it, lads. I didn't really like it at all. It was a tag team match, Shane McMahon, the best in the world, and Drew McIntyre versus Roman Reigns, and a tag partner of Shane and Drew's choosing, because for some reason this week, they got to choose his partner. That's just the story this week on Monday Night Raw. So at various points throughout the night, we saw Shane and Drew scouting people backstage for someone to be Roman's partner. They considered, for example, a garbage man, a guy selling beers in the arena. Uh, but the final one that they settled on was Gary Garbutt, a janitor with a limp. And even though he had a limp and wasn't a wrestler, they also instructed him to stand on the apron and do nothing. They also offered him $5,000, which is very generous of them, but at the same time, it's heelish, isn't it? Because that's nothing to Shane, but he still wants to ensure that they've got a chance to beat down Roman. So he says, yeah, you get $5,000. And then Drew goes like, can we get him a mask? 
were just so well known or there was some weird reason that they need to get him a mask. At first I thought they were being heels and going, oh, look at his face. He's not a wrestling superstar like us. Let's get him a mask. But then the actual reason was something like, yeah, let's get him a mask because we're such well-known famous guys that we don't want the attention drawn away. Also. I didn't quite understand. The point of it was that Roman's going to have a tag partner in a mask. We don't actually know that it's Gary Garber, do we? We think it could be someone else. And that's, that's exactly what happened. Was it effective? Let's find out. No. No, it wasn't effective. So in the match, Roman starts it off and, and eventually just runs shoulder first into the ring post and he's taken out for a while. But just before that spot, he accidentally blind tagged Gary in on the apron. So Gary has to wrestle now, right? Drew goes over to Gary, hoists him over the top rope and tags in Shane. And Shane's looking forward to this, you can tell. But it turns out to Shane's shock and horror and dismay and to nobody's surprise, Gary can actually wrestle. He's hitting enziguris, he's hitting springboards, he's hitting planches, all that sort of stuff. He almost botched his first springboard actually which would have been very embarrassing but he still managed to connect with Shane so it's fine nobody pay attention to that it's absolutely fine but just as Gary is building up a head of steam and everyone's getting into it he gets absolutely wiped out with a massive claymore from Drew which is sold beautifully by the way he just flips over and lands face first on the canvas and Shane picks up the easy pinfall victory because Gary's just staring at the lights um, then Roman chases off the heels they go up the ramp and Gary unmasks to reveal that he's been Cedric Alexander all along, you cheeky baby face scamps. Wait a second, they still lost the match. So yeah, commentary put this over like it's a big, haha, look at the heels, silly heels. They didn't know what hit them. They were like, the baby face has already got one over on them, but they lost. They lost. Cedric got absolutely decimated by that Claymore kick and they lost. So why are the baby faces stood in the ring going like, yeah, I guess we did outfox you guys. And the heels are on the ramp going like, we'll get you next time. Because that's not how the story's meant to work. The baby faces are meant to win. But I guess we can't have Shane McMahon take a pinfall because he's friggin' Shane McMahon and it doesn't make any sense. This gets a D minus, a very frustrating and nonsensical end to Monday Night Raw. Horribly booked, the wrestling was fine, but horribly booked. And I just hope that it's better at Extreme Rules when Gary is subbed out for The Undertaker. Yeah, this show gets a C minus, right? Last week was a huge step up for Monday Night Raw and they've taken a big step back with this week's show. It was pretty lacklustre. As I say, the middle segment of the show really, really dragged. The opening few bits were okay, but were kind of dragged down by that weird commercial break rule. And then the ending there with Gary was, oh, Gary or Cedric was just really ill-advised. Um, I feel as though this is more a comment on the crowd's reaction to Cedric rather than Cedric himself, because when he unmasked, no one popped. But when he was hitting moves in the mask, everyone was like, oh, Gary can wrestle. It just says so much about how underutilized Cedric and many other members of the roster have been since being called up from 205 Live or since moving in the shakeup or whatever. It, oh. It's just sad to see, isn't it? Yeah, not a good Raw. Hopefully Extreme Rules is better and hopefully Raw picks up again next week. Thanks very much for watching and let us know what you think in the comments section down below. You can follow Cultaholic on Twitter at Cultaholic and on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Cultaholic. If you enjoy what we do, then please do check out our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Cultaholic where you can pledge. And don't forget, of course, most importantly of all, to hit subscribe and to join us.